great pleasure to introduce Professor Andy Gavel, uh, Howard, should I mix it up and say Harvard, Howard, <laughs> Howard University. Give me an office, you can say it. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Howard University School of Law, uh, written a great deal about, about antitrust generally, uh, written about the Microsoft case in particular, hard at work with Harry First on a book about uh, the Microsoft case and greater implications of the case. Uh, Andy? Thanks very much, Phil. Um, I'm delighted to be here and, uh, and I've really enjoyed the two days. Um, predictably, since the conference is about the Microsoft cases, we've been talking predominantly about the Microsoft cases. But there have been some references to the Section 2 report that came out uh, this past week. And so I thought for my time today what I would talk about is looking at the Microsoft case in a larger context of what has happened with respect to the law of monopolization and attitudes about monopolization over the last eight years. So I've called my talk, Minding the Gap, How Microsoft Contributed to the DOJs, it's a very long one, eight year effort to reform section two and amplify the gap between US and EU um, uh, antitrust policies on dominant firms. I, I will start out with one apology to Jonathan uh, Zittrain who's uh, not here, uh, he spoke yesterday and spoke disparagingly about using bullets. I, I use bullets, I'm sorry. All right, overview of the talk. In four parts, I'd like to talk a little bit about why the intense scrutiny of Section 2 has arisen um, uh, since 2003. Uh, in this area, when you talk about the internet tidal wave, you're talking about the productivity of academics during the last eight years about Section 2 and Section 2 related issues. Also talk about from browser wars to standards wars, um, the DOJ's efforts to reform Section 2. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit at the end about how wide and how durable the gap is between the EU and the US. And finally, whether or not Section 2 can be rejuvenated if that is a, a goal of some new administration and what, what events during the last seven or eight years might constrain that effort. First, I think there were three triggering events to this um, effort to reform Section 2. One clearly was the Microsoft case, um, uh, which the Bush administration inherited when it came into office. And I think over time it became very clear that although they were modest in their comments at the start and when they settled the case, uh, in truth they had very different views about the scope of Section 2 and we'll, we'll talk about the different heads of the antitrust division, the progression of those during this period. But it was clear that they had some fundamental problems with the case itself. Uh, you can see that in some of their criticisms of other cases. Um, and so that became a, a beginning sort of triggering event. And uh, in talking about the law of unintended consequences, perhaps the greatest unintended consequence of the bringing of the Microsoft case by the Clinton administration was that it triggered this effort by the Bush administration to constrain Section 2. A second and important case in this was the LePage's case in 2003. Uh, you'll recall that the LePage's case involved bundled rebates, and it really triggered a, a, quite an enormous response, both from the, the bar, from commentators. It continues to this day. It's reflected in the Section 2 report, discussions about bundled rebates and how they might um, be treated under Section 2. And finally, I think another important event was in 2005, um, the release in December of that year of the EC discussion paper on Article 82. As we'll see, it was just three or four months after that that our Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission announced that they were going to hold hearings on single firm conduct. To some extent, it really looked like they had been pushed into it. I'm not sure that they really intended to do this in-depth study, but there was a question of whether or not we were going to let the European Commission take the lead and start talking about it without being part of the conversation. And the hearings became part of that conversation. The factors at work, I think, here were a lot of negative commentary generated about Microsoft and LePage's. Um, and this shift of initiative, as I mentioned. I'm going to break the talk down into sort of two groups of things, and we'll um, talk about them separately. The first group are the Microsoft-specific activities, um, uh, things from the settlement to the opposition to the decree, commentaries from the Department of Justice on events in Europe, the European Commission decision, the CFI decision, the Korea decision, sort of a running commentary, and we'll talk about how it was essentially two components to it, defending the US decree as full and fair and all that is needed, but also some fairly undiplomatic attacks on other enforcers and some unfairly uh, diplomatic attacks at the states, or at least opposition. 
But it's not the only part of the picture, and I think this is what broadens out the scope and the perception of what has happened over the last seven, eight years. We're going to look at the enforcement policies of the last eight years, the amicus program, a range of speeches, and finally the DOJ Section 2 report. And I think at the end of the talk, if it's clear, I hope to get across that Microsoft and the DOJ two, Section 2 report of this week are two bookends, um, sort of a, a story being told, this being the end story before the end of this administration on where they think we ought to be going with Section 2. There's three major themes that I think occur in the DOJ's responses from the time of the settlement on to any effort to enforce the antitrust laws against Microsoft. The first was that the settlement, whoop, the first, there we go, the first was that the settlement was tailored to a narrow scope. This is a, a, th a, a theme that came up a little bit earlier, that the DC Circuit decision was narrow and therefore the rem remedy should be tailored narrowly to the scope of that decision and there was no basis for going any further. The second was that yet they repeatedly um, asserted after that narrow theme that it was adequate to provide clear and effective protection for competition and consumers. And finally, that anything more would benefit rivals, a consistent theme both of Microsoft and the Department of Justice during this time, and that it would not benefit consumers, and finally, that it would inhibit innovation. These three themes are really themes that repeat in the press releases and public statements directed at the Europeans and, uh, and the Koreans. First sort of hint of this begins during the Tunney Act proceedings. I've listed this as a criticism of the state's one, and it's only sort of indirectly that, because this was out of the press release about the 30,000 comments. And in looking at the 30,000 comments, the press release concluded that many of the remedial proposals advanced were outside of the realm of the violations sustained by the court or would benefit individual companies rather than consumers. So you see the themes beginning to develop right at the time of the Tunney Act proceedings. Second was the amicus brief in the U.S. Oops, that went too fast. No? Yes? Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. I forgot the order I put these in. Um, Second, focusing on the states come to the end of the process and the most recent uh, episode, the extension of the decree. And again here, after this sort of surprise change of position that they were going to oppose the extension of the de decree, the statement from the Department of Justice that as the final judgments have accomplished their goals. Well, ironically, that may have been true. Um, uh, we could debate what those goals were and how much they accomplished them, um, but I think this cr clearly turned out to be something of an embarrassing moment for the Department of Justice, opposing the extension of their own decree as an amicus in the companion decree, only to have the judge order that the decrees would be extended. Let's back up a little bit and start looking through some of the comments on the European Commission and the Korean cases. Um, I'm not a diplomat by, uh, by profession, um, uh, but it seems quite extraordinary that this would be done through press releases on the days of decisions coming from sister agencies. And I think it's important to look at the, the larger picture of, of what's been happening in the world. I've had some interesting conversations uh, at dinner um, uh, last night and, and yesterday. Um, it's, it's the glass half empty, glass half full sort of problem. Um, if you were to turn back the clock 25 years or so and look at competition policy in the world, it was really the realm of a small number of countries, uh, fairly large and developed countries. Um, and it's quite extraordinary today that you've got 100 countries talking about antitrust. Uh, and from the point of view of compliance of firms, that's a chaotic and scary world. On the other hand, from the point of view of the progress of the planet, it could be a very good sign of moving forward and finding a common language and finding a common set of principles that maybe in 50 years will bring us together on a common view of where it is that world commerce should go. So we're in a difficult period right now. And some of the agencies that are starting off, this isn't so much true of the European Commission, but it's certainly true, I think, of the Koreans. Um, if anything, they need support from the United States when they make decisions. And if there are criticisms to be made, this is my editorializing, the criticisms ought to be made in appropriate and diplomatic ways. But public dress downs is not a way to encourage rule of law around the world on competition law issues. Uh, and it is not a productive way to really encourage even change in position because once you've dressed down and embarrassed 
a, uh, a fellow enforcer in another country, you've essentially made it impossible for them to change their position without creating even more diplomatic excuse me, problems. So I think the, the reactions to the European Commission and the Koreans were, were uniquely, um, uh, I don't know, self-serving in some peculiar way, serving some kind of US political um, goals, uh, or maybe just ill-advised, maybe just ill-advised. But the language is harsh and the formula is the same. In each of these statements you'll see, I have up here the press releases, uh, directed at the European Commission's decision, then the press release directed at the CFI decision, and the press release uh, directed at the KFTC decision. Same formula, defend the U.S. settlement as all that was needed, adequate to restore competition, and attack specific efforts. With these same things, it will interfere with innovation, it will be bad for consumers, uh, and ultimately just wrong on the law. So let's take a look. The United States final judgment provides clear and effective protection for competition and consumers. You could cut and paste that into all three of the, of the press releases, even though they are released by different heads of the agency. This is the, um, uh, the so-called code removal. The, the uh, uh, press release said, sound antitrust policy must avoid chilling innovation and competition, even by dominant companies. It is unfortunate this is on the uh, fine that they gave the largest antitrust fine and I think this is a very, very important and revealing sentence that is anticipating our Section 2 report of this week. The view that with respect to Section 2, the standards are the most ambiguous and controversial area of antitrust enforcement. This too became a theme throughout this period in many speeches by the heads of the antitrust division and it's reflected in the Section 2 report. So there's, there's clearly a view that starts developing in these uh, press releases. No complaint about the disclosures that facilitate interoperability. That would have been a no-no. That's in the settlement agreement here as well. The DOJ press release in response to the CFI. We have, however, concern that the standard applied to unilateral conduct by the CFI will harm consumers, chilling innovation, discouraging competition, same themes. Because of the department's enforcement efforts, consumers have benefited from increased competition, and it goes on, middleware, web browsers, media players, instant messaging, making broad claims on behalf of the U.S. settlement. The Korean release in uh, December of 05, you see sort of the same language, cut and paste, same three themes. Korea's remedy ultimately will harm innovation and the consumers that benefit from it. Not really a good public message to send to another enforcement agency in another country, especially one that is really in the last few years sort of feeling its oats, having some government support and developing a, a serious enforcement program. And finally, sound antitrust of policy must avoid chilling innovation and competition. The United States final judgments provide clear and effective protection for competition and consumers. Clear and effective, that must be why they needed to be extended. Let's take some, a look at some other strategies. I think one of the things I really wanted to try and accomplish, like I said, is to take the, the Microsoft-specific events and see them in the larger context of, of other things that were happening over the last eight years. As I said, I don't think the Microsoft case was the only trigger to this effort to re revisit Section 2. It was one of several developments that developed, I think, into a strategy and a policy. Well, during the Clinton years, there was an average of one to two Section 2 cases brought per year. Um, and during the Bush administration, there is an inheritance of three of those cases. The American Airlines case, the Densply case, and the Microsoft case. The Microsoft case was the first to be decided um, uh, that June after the new administration took office, and it was a relative victory. Um, Densply, as we know, also a victory, and American Airlines was an eventual loss. And there were some interesting issues if you get down to the detail of the briefing of the cases. There was some movement in the theories of the cases, especially in American Airlines, away from um, the post-Chicago non-price predation literature reliance and more towards a more traditional predatory pricing case. Um, but at the end of the day, you had these three cases that carried over, and from that point on, no significant cases were filed um, uh, under Section 2. I've collected here the, the statistics so you can see. These are from the uh, Antitrust Division's own workload statistics. I'll explain the two numbers in a moment. What you have here are number of investigations and number of cases filed. Um, and this covers 93 to 2000, basically the eight years of the Clinton administration. 
um, and the uh, seven years that we have so far in the Bush administration. As you can see, the number of investigations goes up and down um, uh, in both per periods, although generally the trend is downward. Um, uh, and as I said, there's sort of one to two cases brought a year. Um, there is some controversy within our little antitrust corner of the world about these statistics. Um, uh, the reason there's two numbers is if you look at the workload statistics that have been published at different points in times, the numbers are different. Um, uh, so there's been some, some looking back at um, to try and count cases that's been done. Um, and it appears that this one Section 2 case down here is an outlier. Um, uh, it's not really a true Section 2 case. Um, now, it is certainly possible that in seven or eight years, they just didn't see any cases that made sense to bring. Um, but I think when you put it in the context of the, the speeches that we'll look at and the larger efforts, um, it clearly reflects, at least to me, that it was not a high priority. And when you look at the Section 2 report, you see that there is a great level of concern about the dangers of bringing Section 2 cases, both in the conduct area and in the remedial area. Again, consistency in the themes that Section 2 enforcement will actually do more damage than good and should be avoided. The amicus program. Another way, and a more concrete way, and a more durable way that the last eight years has affected Section 2 was through the amicus program, particularly in the Supreme Court. Um, I wrote an article about this last fall looking at um, general Supreme Court antitrust activity over the last 30 years, and the trends at the Supreme Court are quite pronounced. A plaintiff hasn't won an antitrust case in the Supreme Court since 1992, and that was Hartford Fire, sort of a mixed plaintiff defense victory. Um, increasingly, the government has appeared as an amicus in those cases. The government itself hasn't been a party in one of those Supreme Court cases in quite some time, so its primary role has been as an amicus uh, in, in every event during this administration on behalf of the defendants, and they've won every single one of those cases because a plaintiff hasn't won since 1992. Um, the two most important ones here are Trinco and Weyerhaeuser. Linkline, as most of you probably know, is the case that is pending this term um, and involves so-called price squeeze claims. Um, I'm not sure that Weyerhaeuser, although it's criticizable, is, uh, is especially extraordinary in its holding. Um, uh, it is an extension of Brook Group. Brook Group becomes now something of a super precedent in the antitrust area. It's standard, the below cost standard, a standard that is formidable and has to be addressed. And you see that in the debates over bundled rebates, um, that that really needs to be um, considered in any kind of price related behavior. But Trinco, I think, is the, is the case that um, in many ways the body language of Trinco um, is quite threatening, not just to Section 2, but to antitrust enforcement generally. A lot of uh, dicta in there about the, the little known, small, quantifiable benefits of antitrust enforcement, and a lot of body language directed at the private right of action. I've included um, Twombly down here because although Twombly was a conspiracy case, again, Twombly is just dripping with anti-private right of action um, kind of language, concerns about federal judges being able to, con to control um, uh, discovery, ability of the parties to uh, manage discovery costs, the implicit message is that we've over-incentivized private rights of action through terrible damages, attorney's fees, costs of discovery. Um, and again, looking at the case itself on its narrow facts, it's, it's defensible. It wasn't crazy to say that a kind of broad sweeping seven year conspiracy allegation would be enough to get you beyond it. Um, but the, the combined body language and the implications for other cases um, is quite extraordinary. Um, the last time I looked at this in the, in the fall, there had already been in the thousands in terms of cases citing um, uh, Twombly, and any idea that it might be limited to antitrust conspiracy is out the window. It's being cited and used in every kind of antitrust case. I've seen it in Section 2 cases. I've seen it invoking Brunswick and antitrust injury, demanding more particularized pleadings before you can get on to this expensive process of discovery. What are the main themes that you see in these amicus briefs, especially the Section 2 ones? Well, one is the, uh, the major one that comes out in the Section 2 report is that the court ought to embrace narrow Section 2 um, standards. These cases are dangerous. Why are they dangerous? 
Fear of false positives has become sort of a mantra from the antitrust division and from many commentators. Um, there is in the Section 2 report some recognition that false negatives can also be a problem. Um, uh, but clearly the view is that false positives are more costly, more difficult to undo. False negatives more likely to be undone on their own through market forces. Um, the cause, vague standards and unreliable juries. The effect, loss of incentives to compete and innovate. A consequence, again, hold up settlements due to over-incentivized private actions, treble damages and attorney's fees, discovery costs, and even cases like Twombly in the conspiracy context, a subliminal message that we'd much rather just leave this to public enforcement, which can be um, uh, managed by the government. What makes this in part so complex, I think, to evaluate, um, and we'll talk about this in the, in the final slide when we talk about what looks uh, looking ahead for the future is, clearly the Supreme Court is on the same page with some of these main themes. And that means that it can't be easily dismissed. It can't just be viewed as a political issue of Democrats versus Republicans and who's in the White House. You have a long-term movement at the Supreme Court towards narrowing antitrust doctrine. Um, uh, it has now been going on for, in the bigger picture, close to 30 years. Um, and there's no reason to think that this bad body language about private rights of action and antitrust enforcement generally is going to change anytime soon at the Supreme Court. And that has clearly trickled down to the lower courts. Um, you see it in the, the struggles of the antitrust division and the Federal Trade Commission in the merger area. Um, uh, and I think that it, it creates a... Um, uh, a context in which any kind of notion of a revitalized enforcement effort really has to take into account the courts that, um, uh, that these cases will be facing um, uh, and the limits and constraints on the doctrine. And frankly, it also has to take into account the criticism of the old doctrine that has led to these changes. The idea that somehow there were some glory years back before 1977 um, uh, is really outside the consensus view. Um, uh, nobody is challenging cases like Sylvania and BMI. Um, the conversation about where the differences of opinion has sort of worked itself over time into a more narrow channel. We're really arguing about some very refined questions now, um, but within those refined questions there are some pretty broadly different philosophical views about the role of government. I'll talk about that um, in a moment. DOJ leadership speeches, the next piece of this puzzle. Um, I've listed a bunch of speeches. I went through all of them and took a look, and, and there are some more, um, there are other speeches that discuss Section 2, but these struck me as kind of the major statements about Section 2 policy. Um, across going back to uh, Hugh Pate, um, uh, one of the most important, I think, early ones was the common law approach speech that he gave, which built on a very um, interesting article that Bill Baxter wrote um, uh, back in the 80s using a similar title, um, uh, a piece I really recommend. Um, he talked about it in his Benefits of Global Competition. These are, I didn't make up these titles, by the way. These are somewhere, I didn't put the full titles, but these are in the titles of the speeches. Um, uh, no, I didn't make up Cowboys and Gentlemen. Uh, Cowboys and Gentlemen, by the way, is a comparison of US and EU views on dominant firms. <laughs> I, I'm not saying, I'm not, I knew that was coming. I'm not saying which, which are we. Um, this one is called the Second Bush Administration, the Gales of Created Destruction, and I think these two last ones by Tom Barnett, especially the Tiger by the Tail speech that he gave this past summer, um, is very, very much reflected in the Section 2 report. And if you go through and you look at these speeches and you read them all in context, I don't think where the Section 2 report was going to come out is much of a surprise. Um, uh, the only surprise that we've seen is they were not able to get three um, Federal Trade Commissioners to go along with the view. That's not really a surprise either. Anybody who's been sort of watching things carefully over the last eight years, there have been differences between the agencies on shearing plow. The FTC didn't join every brief that was listed. They didn't join the Twombly brief, for example. Um, there have clearly been instances where there's apparent divergence within our own two agencies on the view of where we should be going in the Section 2 area. In the Trinco briefing, there was some subtle changes to the tenor of the briefs from the cert stage to the um, merit stage that reflected some compromise between the two agencies. 
This is a quotation that I pulled out of, of Tom Barmet's speech because I wanted to introduce a, a broader theme here. And it really is something of a quintessential theme in American politics and American theory about government and the economy. Um, Tom said it is in the nature, he's talking about remedies in the case of, of Section 2 violations. It is in the nature, he writes, of successful firms like tigers to pounce and devour and to deprive other hunters of their prey. If you wanted to make Section 2 look like it deals with people who aren't really dangerous, I don't know that the tiger was the best view, but I prefer to watch tigers and successful firms, even dominant firms, from a safe distance and without interfering with their natural activities, confident that any harm they visit on competitors will, in general, redound to society's benefit. Question I would raise for further discussion is whether or not this really is economic analysis or a statement of a deeper political and social philosophy. For fun, I went back and looked at Hans Thorelli's 1954 um, uh, wonderful book on the history of the antitrust laws, uh, and here's something that he had to say on page one. By setting out to prevent and prohibit monopolies, combinations and depredations which had begun to manifest themselves as a rather usual outcome of unbridled freedom of contract, the Sherman Act constituted a major deviation from the ideals of laissez-faire and economic Darwinism. So for you, those of you who are political theory inclined, you remember the debates in the political theorists that precede even our Constitution about the notion of the state of nature and whether or not social contract is a response to the state of nature and whether or not the Sherman Act in the economic sphere was a response to laissez-faire and social Darwinism. I put that up just for some thought because I think it's important not only to look in the context of these little eight-year periods and debates about Democrats and Republicans, in some sense these are quintessential American debates that have gone on for centuries, and they're not even just American debates. These are deeper debates in the political theory about the role of government, how the economy functions, and I think what we're seeing here is some of those debates being played out, and you see it in the Section 2 report. Last word, of course, is the Section 2 report. As I said, I think it's the culmination of seven years of efforts to reform and narrow Section 2. Uh, many of the positions advocated in the briefs are in the speeches, and they're incorporated into the report. Um, one criticism the FTC had was whether or not these court victories are exaggerated. Are they reading the cases, especially cases like Trinko, for all they're worth, as opposed to what might be a more reasonable, narrow reading? That seemed to divide the two agencies on some of their positions. Um, and we will be left to figure out the significance of the FTC dissents and where that leaves the DOJ report um, in terms of any durable impact and meaning. Likely point of controversy, I think, is the refusals to deal. That's already um, been an obvious point of controversy. <coughs> Excuse me. And I suspect, given that um, if you go back to the second part of the IP report that came out a couple of years ago, there's an issue in there about refusals to license. And in the refusal to license context, it's quite clear that the agencies could not really agree on which of the competing standards in our courts of appeals cases was the right standard, Kodak versus CSU Xerox, if you remember the debate. And they came out, I don't remember the exact language, I knew I should have put it on the slide because I'd forget, but it was the most, most mealy-mouthed kind of fudged thing that two agencies could imagine that they would say without really saying anything. Um, and I suspect the DOJ at this point of the administration was not willing to do that, and they weren't willing to compromise further. They wanted to state their views and state them clearly and put them in a coherent framework, and so they went ahead and did that. And their view on refusals to deal is that antitrust liability for a mere unilateral, unconditional refusal to deal with rivals should not play a meaningful role in Section 2 enforcement. That's not quite what Trinko says. That's sort of sticking an amplifier in Trinko and trying to read it for all it's worth. Um, and since we are here at Harvard and I knew that we would be footsteps from Arita Hall, I thought it would be worth um, uh, pointing out something about the Arita quotation that I have up on the board. Um, the Supreme Court cited this article by Professor Arita in Trinko. Um, it's probably one of the most frequently cited articles in any debates about essential facilities. Uh, he described essential facilities as an epithet in, in search of limiting principles. 
Um, but it's often cited for the kind of visual impact of the insult. Essential facilities must be crazy. But lost in the reading of this relatively short and insightful piece about essential facilities is that he proposes what a standard would be. So he doesn't reject the idea of essential facilities doctrine, he just says we need some standards. And in an interesting footnote, interesting as you'll see in a moment because I think it relates ultimately to our debates about and discussions about Microsoft, he endorses the result in MCI versus AT&T and says that was probably a correct decision. I think that's significant for our discussions today because if you compare the standard that was articulated in MCI with the standard articulated by the court of first instance, although without citation, I think they clearly had MCI as one of the sources they were looking at, there are some obvious similarities between the standards that are chosen. I also put this up for um, purposes of a couple of my final points about the quote unquote gap between the United States and Europe. Is there a gap between the United States and Europe on Section 2 issues, on dominant firm issues? I think the answer is yes. I think that Article 82 has very different views of what is dominance and what is exclusionary conduct. The question on my mind is how big is the gap? And I think that this movement within the um, Department of Justice over the last seven, eight years has created the perception that the gap is wider than it actually is. And if you look at all the different pieces we've put up, there's a gap between the FTC and the DOJ. There's a gap between DOJ and some commentators. The point is, is that we are debating this here in the US, which means that there is some possibility that the gap will close. But I do emphasize that I think we are on some pretty different tracks and some very basic ideas. I agree with the comment that you know, total convergence is not likely to happen. Um, but we are talking about similar frameworks and I would emphasize the glass half full again, um, uh, that the degree of, of agreement on basic framework is far more significant for us in the long term than the areas that we might have disagreements. And that's my point about what lies ahead. Final slide here, um, how about rejuvenating section two? Well, if rejuvenating section two means bringing back more uh, robust enforcement at the agencies, I think that there are going to be some hard questions to be asked of the agencies before they go running off to court and bringing any cases. For one, 1998 versus 2008 are 10 years since the Microsoft case. The case law is different. If you go back to the, um, the primary appellate brief that was filed in the DC circuit by the um, Department of Justice, a couple of real key paragraphs there. What are the cases relying on? Aspen, Kodak, Newman versus Reinforced Earth, the decision from the DC Circuit. Um, at the end of three paragraphs, Doug's statement about no economic sense. It's in there, but it comes in the context of those cases. Well, where are those cases? If you look in the Trinco briefs, Kodak is you know, banished to the, uh, the attic with the crazy ant. Um, uh, Aspen skiing is now on the outer edge, according to the court uh, in Trinco. Um, now, if you look at some of the conduct, we come back to maybe some of it's pretty straightforward, pretty basic. It doesn't need those cases. Maybe the Microsoft decision itself and the framework it sets out is where we are, but we're still arguing about what that balancing stuff means and whether there is a section two rule of reason. Um, so I think any effort to rejuvenate is going to have to think hard about that Section 2 report. I think that's why they released it. It is now something to be reckoned with, even if it's withdrawn on January 21st. Could a targeted program of test cases successfully challenge any of the, the more extreme court assumptions, court with a capital C as in Supreme Court? Um, I think that is going to be one of the things that a, a new enforcement group will have to um, think about, reflect on the way the civil rights movement approached civil rights cases, thinking about what the targeted, focused um, issues are that could be improved upon, and looking hard for cases that might test those principles. That's hard to do, it takes time, uh, and criticism of zero cases is going to mean there will be you know, pressure to bring cases. Uh, and I only hope that if they do decide to bring cases, they give, bring good ones that are defensible, like I think the original Microsoft case was, uh, because more defeats in the Supreme Court will really narrow and narrow the box until Section 2 is a pretty irrelevant, small little feature, which might work for some. But, maybe be problematic for others. Thanks very much.
Sure, sure. Any questions? Yeah, Karen. I hope this won't be too wonky, but uh, just going back to the Arita quote about essential facilities, one thing that always uh, uh, was in my mind or I thought about during the trial was the, the fact that a lot of people were saying uh, that Microsoft that it was a shame that the judges had um, overturned all of the cases from the 70s on essential facilities. And I'm wondering how you think it would have played out if the government had actually just really rolled the dice to the end and said, you know what, Microsoft is an essential facility. We think it's like the railroad to, you know, you know, to your desktop and it ought to be regulated. Or is the, or is the bench just so um, against that kind of argument? Uh, I think they would have got reamed pretty good, is my uh, immediate uh, response. The, the, the question would have been, even looking back at that Arita piece, could you have framed this case in a way where the facts of the case met that frame? I don't know that they did. I think okay. it would have been very hard to frame this case mm -hmm. as an essential facilities case. And refusal Why? to deal was not really um, part of the, the case here. Mm -hmm. It was part of the European case, and I think one of the interesting things in comparing the two cases is you can come up with a remedy of a duty to deal in cases that don't re uh, involve conduct of refusal to deal. That's one of the things we did here. I prefer when I talk about refusal to deal to really talk about when it is that we are willing to impose a duty to deal. Refusal to deal is one situation where we might, but it's not necessarily the only remedy that would be available. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have duty to deal in other cases um, uh, where refusal to deal was not the conduct. Yeah. Anyone else? Gosh, it's just like class. Oh, there is one. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, please. Thanks. Yeah, you know, when we talk about the difference between the U.S. and EU on antitrust policy, but it really can't exist in a vacuum. It, it branches out of a whole view of how to organize an economy. I mean, we have not had statutory change in the antitrust laws in the United States in a long time, and we've seen the pendulum swing back and forth. My, uh, my favorite quote to counter the one about tigers pouncing is actually from uh, Richard Hofstetter's essay, Whatever Happened to the Antitrust Movement, which came out in 66 or 67. And he has a line where he says something like, uh, every businessman in America spends his time looking over one shoulder for, for antitrust enforcers from the Department of Justice to come and second guess his business decisions, which I think is probably not a good description of the current environment. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the U.S. So I guess, I mean, how can, you know, how can, how can we talk, doesn't there have to be a gap as long as we've got a debate within the world about whether or not we should have a primarily free market economy with some sort of social safety net in place or primarily paternalistic economy that allows free markets only to the extent that it doesn't interfere with social welfare? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll answer the question with a, a brief story. Uh, I was at a, um, a, a small conference, it was one of these sort of dinners with invited guests, things talking about antitrust issues. And there was a representative from the Department of Justice, we were talking about Article 82, um, uh, and they said that the, the problem was that the Europeans just don't understand, and we just haven't done a good enough job of explaining to them where it is that we are. Um, and, I, and I asked him afterwards, why isn't it possible that they completely understand they just disagree and think our standards are too lenient and too permissive, which I think they do. I don't think there's a, a challenge of understanding here. Um, I think they look at cases like Trinco and they look at cases uh, uh, you know, coming out of our, I think they're looking at the Section 2 report as a challenge to their own discussion paper on Article 82 that essentially is a, a, a very extreme view of how small dominant firm enforcement could be. But I liken this to, uh, civil procedure is my other love, and, and I liken this to the kind of question that goes to a jury. What kind of question goes to a jury? By definition, the question on which reasonable jurors could disagree. I think that one of the places we need to get as an enforcement community is to stop just dismissing saying we're right and everyone else in the world is wrong. The beginning of a more meaningful discussion comes from recognizing that they may just have a different view. They have a different historical experience, for example, with dominant firms. Uh, 
We didn't have an IG Farben like Germany that twisted the government for, uh, for profits from war. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, we do. Sorry, forgot that. Um, but there, there really are some differences in regional experiences with dominant firms that would cause people to be a little bit more concerned about the power of corporate money. It's present in our culture. You can't watch a James Bond movie without there being some you know, corrupt corporation trying to destroy the world for profit. Um, so it's present in our own culture. It's very much present in other cultures. Um, like I said, I prefer to see the glass half full. Do I agree with their standards as opposed to our standards? I think that we have gotten too extreme in our standards in terms of leniency. I think there are some ways in which they are endangering efficient business practices. Um, but if you can't accept that there's conversation, if you just want to go teach them about economic analysis, I come back to my slide on Tom Barnett. I don't really view that as economic analysis. That's ideology, and I think they've figured that out too. But doesn't, doesn't the economic analysis have to come from an ideology? I mean, what you're going to find, you, you, can, you can certainly analyze the numbers, but whether you find something as a harm to competition, doesn't that have to depend on your view of how the economy should be structured to begin with? In, in, again, to use civil procedure, yes, but in civil procedure we think about burdens and presumptions. And I think what you're seeing is coming from a different position on burdens and presumptions. Let me give you one hard example from the Section 2 report, the disproportionality standard. Okay? A disproportionality standard means the tie goes to the defendant. So if you have a balancing test, whatever that means, and I don't think uh, I agree, I forget who said it earlier, we don't really use a balancing test. There's no reported cases where a judge or a jury says, well, there's $5 more anti-competitive effect than efficiency, so therefore we condemn. The way jurors and judges decide cases is on the strength of the evidence, and they either believe the anti-competitive story or they believe the efficiency story, but there's none of this sort of dollar-for-dollar trade-off. But assuming that the difference is a balancing test means that whoever is a dollar ahead, that's where you come down. But a disproportionality test says the room for error there is too great. So we're going to require the plaintiff to prove that the anti-competitive effect is disproportional. You could very easily articulate the opposite standard and say if there's evidence of some anti-competitive effect, we're going to require the defendant to show that the efficiencies are disproportionate to the anti-competitive effect. It's two mirror standards, but it's a matter of what presumption you bring to the table and, and where it is you think the better um, uh, direction would be and whether you're more concerned about false positives or false negatives. So yes, economic analysis and ideology are clearly you know, intertwined. But I think when you get to the point of trying to sell ideology as economic analysis, you're being disingenuous. Yeah. That. You turn your mic on. Talk. From other, from foreign jurisdictions, and maybe I'm, I'm agree with about 95% of what you're saying. It, it's not a difference in economics. They read the same text. Their economists are as good as our economists. They understand the economics, um, and it's not. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, it's not a difference of, a, of empirical judgment either about what it is that will make a market efficient or inefficient. It comes, I think, from differences in the political uh, and legal culture. For example, in Europe, I think it's a much more statist culture. They don't have the concern about false positives, not because false positives aren't important, but because they have more confidence in government than we do. I think. And I think you can trace that through a number of the other differences. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, uh, on. Um, uh, uh, unintended consequences and be careful what you wish for and so forth. At least from my perspective, I didn't do, no, have any uh, involvement in the international antitrust area until I went to the Justice Department in, in 96. Um, and the perception I had there was that a lot of the proselytizing uh, of uh, antitrust, which has now led to this global mess, um, came from the U.S. business community, which thought that antitrust, if exported, would enable, um, uh, for, would enable U.S. Uh, companies to use antitrust to open up foreign markets to trade that they thought were, were, were blocked by anti-competitive practices and local cartels and the like. I used to give, the Justice Department was, was actually very conservative, as if it was the trade people in the U.S. government who were pushing that, along with the Europeans who had a similarly uh, imperialistic uh, uh, agenda. I, I used to give speeches uh, showing how diplomatic I was, saying that antitrust law is like a driver's license, and you shouldn't give it to, your, uh, to a 
teenager until he's mature enough to handle it. And if too many immature teenagers have it, you're going to have a lot of collisions. Uh, and um, uh, that, that was fairly close to where the Justice Department was then, but we lost that battle because of U.S. firms who, who didn't understand that they might be defended someday. Why don't we go ahead and stop there, even though I'd love to, to go on. We have a lot more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. It was great stuff. <laughs>